So I'll be kicking off the next um, topic for today's discussion. Um, and I will be introducing our panelists in just a moment, but I thought I would take the opportunity and just give a brief introduction of this panel um, entitled Opportunities and Challenges of Auditing Digital Financial Assets. During the global financial crisis, we learned a lot about our markets and about risk. Markets weren't supposed to freeze, but they did. Investors lost trillions, global economic growth slumped. We learned that innovative financial products, derivative financial instruments, credit default swaps, securitizations, embedded certain risks that were hidden from view. Hidden from investors, hidden from regulators, hidden from a great many of us, and hidden from the financial statements though off balance, through off-balance sheet vehicles, a variety of legal structures, contracts that made little economic sense or simply falsehoods. And when those risks made their appearance in 2007 and 2008, it was like a beach ball held underwater had finally been let go. When let go, the forces were no longer balanced and the beach ball shot upward. The beach ball, Lehman's meltdown, spread contagion throughout the global financial system and economic destruction ensued. $20 trillion, about $62,000 per person in the United States in wealth evaporated. Unemployment spiked, retirement savings accounts shed 25%. 8 million homes went through foreclosure. Congress intervened and put guardrails on our financial system through the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. And just as this was happening, an innovation was launched, Bitcoin. The first reported commercial exchange of Bitcoin occurred just over a month before the Dodd-Frank Act was passed on May 22nd, 2010. An early Bitcoin enthusiast at, at, an early Bitcoin enthusiast used Bitcoin for his purchase of pizza, and enthusiasts celebrate this as Pizza Day every May 22nd. All things crypto exploded. Digital assets have been trending and receiving the attention of celebrities, often through endorsements. Crypto assets are marketed using a variety of terms, including digital assets, cryptocurrencies, coins and tokens, or with reference to blockchain technology. In 2017, the combination of enthusiasm, hype, and crypto frenzy led to a perfect storm. Initial coin offerings, or ICOs, took investors for a ride. It didn't last long. In 2017 and 2018, more than 800 ICOs raised roughly $20 billion, about $62 per person in the US. These tokens collapsed in short order. Many were simply scams. Since then, in Europe, authorities exposed money laundering cases in Asia, the collapse of Terra Luna revealed apparent fraud, and in the US, the collapse of a veritable crypto exchange seems to have revealed an elaborate Ponzi scheme. Just last month, 12 years after the first pizza day, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or FASB, voted to advance its first standard on cryptocurrencies and digital assets. I encourage all of us to comment on the exposure draft, which will be released later this month. The FASB acted in response to hundreds of letters demanding action from a range of interested parties, including one that stated, the disconnect between an entity's financial statements and the economic reality of its financial condition and results of operations creates confusion and fails to provide investors, analysts, and the general public with the information they need to make an informed assessment of an entity's current and future prospects. The purpose of today's panel is to unpack that disconnect the confusion and the information void. And it kind of does dovetail with our prior panel as well. So with that, please let me introduce our esteemed panel. Uh, today we are joined by Dr. Douglas Carmichael, Professor of Accounting Auditing at Brew College, Amy Steele, Audit and Assurance Partner at Deloitte and & Touche, and Jeff John Roberts, Crypto Editor, uh, Fortune Article on Crypto Audits and Kings of Crypto. So with that, let me just start with some questions for our panel. I have prepared some questions and then we'll open it up for questions from the IAG and the PCOB board. Let's start with Mr. Roberts. You have written extensively on Bitcoin, have used a stable coin and stepped into crypto's latest Web3, purportedly the next generation of an online ecosystem. Where is crypto in our culture? Is it still an experiment? Is it predatory and dangerous? Is it being regulated or is regulation its death? 
Um, wow, that's a lot to unpack. Um, yeah, I've covered crypto for more than a decade, but I work, you know, I write for a mainstream financial publication, Fortune. So I don't take either view. I mean, in the crypto world, there's a lot of people who are wild-eyed zealots and tell you it's going to make you rich. And we kind of know what those people are. But conversely, there's a lot of people who I just think instinctually dislike and distrust crypto. And people have written Bitcoin is dead headlines for years. Finally, it's clear Bitcoin's not dead. Um, and you know, I think crypto, it's important to think of it as a technology, not simply money. I mean, it is money, but, you know, blockchain technology, I think, is a profound, you know, revolutionary piece of software that changes the way we interact and also, you know, creates interesting incentive schemes, but it also creates massive opportunities for for fraud. And I've seen four of these cycles where I remember I covered this in 2013 when the price of Bitcoin went to an unfathomable like $1,200. And that was just insane. Um, and, you know, it surely was a bubble and it was and it popped and went down to $300. But I've seen sort of four more of these cycles. And every time the floor is a lot lower than, uh, you know, than it once be before. Um, just finish by saying we're currently in what they call crypto winter. And after the carnage of FTX and intense regulatory backlash, you know, Bitcoin is down, but it's still above 20,000, which is the, you know, above where it reached in the last uh, bull cycle in 2017. So, I mean, you know, I'm confident crypto is very much here to stay but the regulatory pressure is like nothing I've seen before. Amy, you're on mute. Goodness, I'm sorry about that. Um, let's go to Ms. Steele. Uh, you are involved in the Digital Assets Working Group for the AICPA. Can you please bring us up to speed on the work that is being done there. Also, generally, what are you seeing in the practice as it relates to audits of digital assets and or proof of reserves? Sure, happy to. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, for having me here today. Um, I'll start with the work of the Digital Assets Working Group. So I, I am involved in the work there. I co-chair that working group. Um, that working group has has three subgroups to it. There's the accounting subgroup, the auditing subgroup, and then a newly formed attestation subgroup. Um, the working group was formed by the AICPA under, under ASAC, ASB, and FINREC committees to really assist in developing non-authoritative guidance for auditors and issuers to consider when accounting for and auditing digital assets. Um, the output of this working group is a practice aid that you can find on the AICPA's website. We do call it a living document. So as emerging issues come up in the space, which, which they do, um, we study those as a working group and we issue additional guidance um, to, to that practice aid. There also is a very helpful glossary. As, as Amy said in the introduction, there's a lot of terms in this space. Um, we did attempt to come up with a glossary so we could all be speaking a common language and, and we find that very, very helpful. Um, from an accounting standpoint, the working group has established guidance that is industry agnostic that really addresses the initial measurement, the subsequent measurement, and the derecognition of digital assets. They've also developed um, industry specific guidance as it relates to brokers and dealers and, and investment companies. And then specific guidance as it relates to certain um, aspects of the ecosystem, stable coins, um, contracts that involve derivatives, um, embedded derivatives, crypto lending, borrowing, and crypto mining. From an audit standpoint, um, we started out very focused on some big fundamental topics, um, the first of which is acceptance and continuance. So really focusing on what should auditors think about before accepting a client in the space or continuing with a company um, that operates in, in the digital assets ecosystem. Um, and then we pivoted to risk assessment, which is, of course, very fundamental to our audits. Um, understanding an entity's processes and controls, and then we focused on unique risks as it relates to illegal acts and related parties. Um, so you may ask what we're up to now. Um, from an auditing standpoint, we are working on developing um, more focused Q&As as it relates to certain aspects of performing these audits, specifically related to valuation, existence, and rights and obligations of digital assets. Um, we're also working on content as it relates to service organizations. So um, a lot of entities in the digital assets ecosystem will use a third party for certain activities. So for instance, they'll use a third party custodian to custody digital assets. Um, those third parties may have what we call a service auditors report that focuses on the controls over that service organization. 
So we're developing content to help auditors in reading and understanding and evaluating those service auditors reports. Um, the accounting subgroup is working on some learning as it relates to derivatives and mining and crypto lending and borrowing. They are also very actively monitoring the activities of the FASB related to crypto assets. Great. All of the content, yeah, one other thing, um, as it relates to this content, it is all non-authoritative. So it is interpreting current standards today as it relates to accounting and auditing um, and then providing guidance. So Amy, as it relates to your second question as to what we're seeing in practice today, I would say companies we're seeing them really focus on their internal controls. A lot of companies in the space are younger emerging companies that are building out robust controls. Um, from an auditor standpoint, I would say we're seeing an increased demand for audits um, in this space. We're seeing accounting firms really investing in their skill sets, tools, technologies to be able to execute quality audits. We're also seeing increased demand for what I called um, the soft reports, the service auditors reports to give um, assurance on controls that service audit entities and then also an increased demand as it relates to transparency and trust for um, entities that are in custodial relationships um, with their customers. Hmm. That's really helpful. Thank you, Amy. Um, Dr. Carmichael, there are many that will say technology may change the form of a financial instrument, but it cannot alter the substance. Is that fair? And then just a couple uh, additional, if, what are, what are an auditor's duties when digital assets are a material component of the financial statements? And what are the inherent financial statement assertions and how are they being addressed? We can't hear you. I'm not sure if you're on mute or let me look. Excuse me. Oh, there uh, you go. I was saying the two, the, the two questions, uh, actually blend together. It reminds me a lot of what was uh, said about uh, auditing when use of computers was greatly expanding a, a while ago. And, and that is that the audit objectives remain the same. The, the means of accomplishing them may differ. So uh, for example, the audit assertions uh, are going to stay the same uh, the same five in the, in the PCOV auditing standards. But for example, uh, risk and ownership is going to assume greater importance because of the importance of establishing the ownership of the private key to get into some of the details. Uh, existence or uh, occurrence uh, is still going to be there and extremely important, but again, uh, without ownership, uh, there really can't be existence. So uh, the auditor is going to be uh, applying the same standards, uh, but will be using different tools. Uh, there, there are uh, some of the things that Amy's group is dealing with. There are, are software tools that, that are available uh, for uh, establishing the evidence to say substantiate the ownership of the private key and so on and determine uh, the completeness of the transactions, making sure the auditor gets all the addresses that are being used uh, in, in, the, in the transactions. So the um, substance isn't really changing, but the means of accomplishing them and the details are, are certainly uh, going to be different. Great. Thank you for each of those responses to each of those questions. Now I have um, some general questions that I'd like to pose of all of you. Um, you don't have to answer them all if you if you're not if it's not your area of expertise. But whoever wants to start, that'd be great. So then my next question is: What type of information could be provided to investors and analysts to better address? The inherent risks of digital assets, and how could this information be provided? Um, I'll go first. I think it was a good start what FASB is doing to to let uh, companies mark to market because the previous regime where they had to treat it as intangible assets was sort of silly because they're not like trademarks. Sure, they fluctuate, but that accounting regime didn't work. So I think the current one's a lot more sensible. 
Um, you know, finally, it's a new asset, so it's very volatile. It's not nearly as volatile as it used to be, you know, especially Bitcoin and Ethereum. But anything new, a new blockchain, a new token could easily go to zero the next day. So beware of those. And then I think just to the notion of blockchains are, are public and you can see, you know, everyone can see how many, how many assets are in a wallet. So I think, you know, having staff who are, who are versant and familiar with crypto and blockchain is, is very helpful because you can verify things. The only trouble right now is often firms are offshore and then collateralize the assets they, they have. So you might see the assets in a wallet, but you don't know if they've pledged them to secure some 50x leveraged loan somewhere else. So, you know, it feels like we're slowly fumbling towards an improved system, but, you know, certainly the, uh, the crypto industry needs the help from, from seasoned accountants. Um, I'm happy to share share some thoughts. I think uh, that the SEC's Fan Hub is an important initiative for communicating with with investors and and analysts and really understanding the ecosystem and understanding uh, the different models, business models that are in play. Um, maybe outside the focus of the PCAB and maybe more relevant to the SEC. But I I do think that this industry, particularly the younger, more emerging companies, can really benefit from the learnings of traditional finance that that we have today. Um, education on what are the traditional financial risks, liquidity risks, collateral risks, and how those relate to the digital assets ecosystem. I think that could go a long way. Um, from a PCOB perspective, I do think that um, the PCOB can continue to have a role in providing tips to auditors as to the staff's views on how to apply current audit standards today to this class of assets. I think. Um, Staff alerts and, and spotlights are really helpful to, to show auditors how to apply the current standards to, to this new um, emerging area. Uh, yeah, let me add that I think that the in in any issue like this, the uh, three things are important: the regulatory framework that is operated within, and the accounting standards and the auditing standards. And each group is going to be in its own lane, but needs to cooperate, coordinate. Um, certainly, the uh, staff, the uh, alerts that can be issued on uh, the software tools that are available, using the software tools, and so on. There's some very general things that uh, also could be of uh, great help. Uh, one of the, I think, one of the initial practice problems is going to be the coordination between the specialists that are uh, very familiar with the industry, with, with blockchain and the various tools that can be used, and the generalist auditors. That has always been a problem, say, in the computer area of, of the coordination between those Two groups and make making sure the the generalist auditors understand what can and can't be accomplished. Some other basic things uh, that some of the recent frauds and the FTX scandal uh, bring out is uh, you know emphasizing you you can't do an audit uh, unless there are good controls in the first place. You may not be auditing internal control and giving an opinion on it. But it's impossible to do an audit with without a certain level of controls. Very important to identify the entity that you're auditing. And uh, when entities are under common control, just the impossibility of doing an audit. Uh, if you're all auditing only one of the entities in, under common control and not getting access to the others. Uh, and then something that that uh, really hasn't been done well uh, in just audits that are being done now is getting the information out there on the kinds of frauds that are possible, the kinds of frauds that are occurring, uh, and what might be done to detect them. In order to assess the risks, you really not need to first understand those kinds of things. And, the accumulation of communication of that type of in information hasn't really been very good. I'd like to have a follow up with you, Dr. Carmichael, um, and it's really a naive question, so apologies in advance. But you talked about 
um, generalist auditors versus the use of specialists. And maybe Amy, you can help answer this too, but so are you suggesting that there is a specialist auditor that they that the generalists tap into for potentially the crypto assets of a company that would be specializing in uh, in that type of audit, sort of like how in an audit of a public pension plan, they may tap into an actuary as a specialist. The auditor will tap into an actuary to assess our assumptions, et cetera, for, um, you know, correctness essentially is that is that what you're saying as it relates to generalists versus specialists and Amy is that kind of what the AICPA is thinking is developing a specialist um, approach or am I thinking of that incorrectly and apologies for the naive question well I you know my thought was that it's going to be inevitable at the beginning that um, not all the auditors are going to be doing audits are going to be familiar enough familiar enough with uh, the risks, with the software tools that are available. Uh, there, uh, for example, are several ways that, that the control of the private key might be audited and substantiated, and they have different shortcomings. So my thought was that, you know, not everybody is going to be familiar with those things, and there are are going to be uh, there inevitably have to be people that are the specialists that learn that uh, learn all the software tools available, understand uh, the different ways of uh, establishing those things. When you get to the valuation assertion, there you know there are a whole host of problems because you you have uh, you don't have quoted market prices. You have a large number of exchanges all around the world um, and that are open 24 hours a day. Uh, so figuring out uh, when the transaction should be recorded, uh, whether it has been recorded appropriately in that regard, and um, what, uh, and so the account, it's a good example that the accounting standards are the same. So the FASB has an accounting standard on fair value. Uh, you have to identify the principal market in order to determine the fair value. But uh, with crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, uh, that's considerably more difficult to do. So the people that have, the, have, uh, have acquired the expertise to do those things are are going to be doing it, but uh, I don't think everybody on the audit team is going to be equipped to to do those things. Amy, I'm happy to expand as well, and and I don't think that's a naive question at all. I think um, in any emerging space, that's important for us to think about the skill sets that we put on our our audits, um, and this is this is one of those areas. From an AICPA perspective, that is why we tackled acceptance and continuance first. And the, the first pillar of acceptance and continuance and the preconditions to accepting an audit is to make sure that you have the skill sets to be able to conduct a quality audit. And so we go through in, in that literature, thinking through if you have the appropriate skill sets to, to carry it out. Um, so that's, that is what the firms um, are, are thinking about when they take on any of these audits. now. As far as if you include a specialist in the audit, I think it depends. And just like with any of our audits and looking at the totality of, of the, the audit evidence and the audit execution, do you need to bring specialists in to help you execute certain procedures? That may be the case. Um, and that is something that you think about early on um, before you even accept the client. Yeah. I just that was clear on the specialist front, how quick, like, you know, about 10 years ago, there's maybe five crypto lawyers in the field and maybe two accountants has changed dramatically. For instance, there's a cottage industry in divorces where, you know, one of the spouses will go and, you know, hide the, the, the money in crypto in an offshore wallet. So I know like, you know, at least five divorce lawyers who are used to partnering with forensic accounting firms to track this down and track evidence. You know, my point being, it's just that this is rapidly evolving and the, it's not as esoteric as it used to be even two years ago. So finding people who are, you know, specialists, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite as specialized as it used to be. It's become an increasingly common skill in my opinion. 
Great. Well, thank you for that enlightenment. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about sort of some of the challenges uh, associated with um, with these assets and, and what information investors might like to see. But can we just talk about some of the challenges as it relates to specific spe specifically auditing them? And I, I think we've kind of touched on it, but are there any things that we haven't touched upon as it relates to auditing these assets that um, that we should bring to light um, just to talk through? Um, I'm happy to start as, as the auditor on the panel. So um, I would say, I mean, the audits in the space, um, I, I echo Jeff's sentiments, but we've we've definitely evolved and um, it's not as hard as, as it was when we were first trying to figure this out several years ago and we formed the, the working group, but still the audits in the space are hard, they're complex. Um, they get even more complex when there's multiple types of digital assets and, and multiple blockchains involved. Um, some of the unique, there, there's unique risks, there's unique forms of, of audit evidence um, that really challenge the ways that we've historically applied the professional standards. There's evolving business models. Um, there's an evolving regulatory environment. There's technology changes. There's financial reporting development. So the space is always moving, which is really important as we conduct our audits to think about all of the different moving pieces. Um, three areas probably to expand on one, my, my evidence point, um, and I think Doug, um, had, had touched on this as well, that oftentimes in this space, we do use tools and technology to be able to help, um, gather evidence as it relates to digital assets. And that evidence often looks different than, than other areas. We're not going in and observing a building to, to prove that it exists. We're looking to the blockchain and pulling evidence of a block off a blockchain and then questioning, can I rely on this evidence? Is this blockchain reliable? And so um, that presents some unique challenges and unique thinking as it relates to that, that um, new, new data and technology. And I think that um, syncs up really well with one of the PCOB's projects on data and technology and how do we use these new forms of data and technology to be able to continue to audit smarter and take those big forms of data, but, but definitely an area that I would say is both a challenge and, and an opportunity. Um, the evolving business models, I spoke earlier about stock reports. Um, those are critical. Um, when when um, assets are custodied at a third party, the best case is when there's a SOC report over that third party that gives um, gives management confidence that there's controls over the safeguarding of those assets. It is an emerging space. And so while we're starting to see more SOC reports, it's, it's not currently the norm. So that could present challenges. And then the last area um, that I'd, I'd mention is just the evolving regulatory landscape. Um, we're all learning and, and there's new regulations, um, whether it's at state or federal or other levels. Um, we saw SAB 121 issued by um, the SEC, the interpretive literature that put the custodial assets on the books last year. And I think that was a challenge for companies as they thought through what are my controls over this. And um, we're going to continue to see that in an evolving area that we're going to have new regulations that we need to think through. Um, in response to those, I think that it's really important and I get back to acceptance and continuance again for, um, for auditors and others to really think through um, for these companies, what's their role in the ecosystem? What's the complexity of their business? What types of digital assets do they have? What are their controls over those digital assets? And, and those are the same messages that we we had when we came uh, when we started the practice aid three years ago. Is really understand um, understand the entity, understand management and their skill sets to be able to support their books and records, and make sure that we have the right people um, conducting the audits as well. Okay, that's great, Amy. Can I ask you another naive question? And I'm going off script here, so I, I'm I'm certain that I'm making a lot of people nervous. But as it relates to the SOC reports, I really think that is critical and quite interesting, because uh, we depend on those a lot in investing. Uh, you know, for our custodian and our service providers, they're really critical. So, as you're auditing, or if you have uh, the acceptance and continuation uh, continuance. Um, do you feel okay about that? What if there isn't a SOC report available? Is that something that you get knowledge of in advance of accepting an audit? Or is that something you discover in in an audit of these types of things? And and what would you do with that? Um, just in general, do you have any thoughts? Or is it is that too putting you on the spot there? 
<laughs> I don't mind being put on the spot, Amy. Uh, no, I, I think it depends on the facts and circumstances. Um, we, we do try to understand a lot about the entity before we ever accept a client. Um, and so those are critical questions to ask around the auditability. So what types of digital assets, what are management's controls over those digital assets? Are those digital assets self-custodied? Are they custodied with a third party? If they're with a third party, is there a stock report? If there's not a stock report, asking management, well, how, how do you get comfortable that those digital assets exist? Um, and management needs to have those controlled. So absolutely, it's something that we're thinking about every day um, before you ever get into an audit and asking those questions. Things are evolving quickly. So there's more stock reports than we had a year ago. And, and hopefully a year from now, I can say, it's the norm to have stock reports, but it's, again, it's an emerging area and, and people are learning together and we're having um, these discussions so that we're able to, to help the capital markets as, as much as we can and really move forward with the forms of evidence that we have. That's great, super helpful. Let me Does anybody uh, else? add to that. I, I think the, as far as the standard setters, uh, emphasizing the importance of the application of the current standards to the situation. So it may it may be that an auditor would not take on an engagement where getting a SOC report was important, but one was not available. But um, the emphasis on the, if there isn't a SOC report, you still need to achieve the objectives. You may, the SOC report idea was created to avoid having a, a, a herd of auditors to send on a particular entity uh, to do the same thing. But uh, in particular circumstances, it still may be necessary if there's not a SAC report for the auditors to get in there and do it themselves. Uh, emphasizing what the objective is and the necessity of dealing with it in the, uh, the circumstances that may be encountered is important. There are some very detailed things like the, uh, I think we've probably all read about FTX and that a, a line of code was inserted to give a back door. So to what extent as the auditor, do you need to be satisfied with the code? Do you need to have a specialist that can come in and review the code? Um, what as uh, if it's if it's the controller of the entity that is responsible for putting in the code, is there any other way to deal with it? So that's that's part of looking at the kinds of problems that are occurring in practice, uh, which people are doing, but also then being responsive in in, in emphasizing the objectives that need to be achieved, and the fact that they're, if they are not achieved, then you can't complete the audit. I think just going back to the general, the last session and the general things, one of, one of the problems is the auditor has an emphasis to, to give an opinion, and many auditors view their job is giving an opinion no matter what the situation is. And there are just some situations where you're not going to be able to give an opinion uh, and recognizing those situations and where you can't get the evidence, you can't give an opinion it is going going to need emphasis in this area, I think. Yeah, that's really I just add to someone who covers the crypto industry day in, day out, um, you know, how much I think, uh, you know, there needs to be standards promulgated, you know, SOC, but other things as well, because currently what I hear from big crypto companies is we want the big four to audit us, but they don't have the capacity to do it. Um, but then I was talking to a guy at ENY who's like, yeah, yeah, we can. It's just they don't want to, you know, be able, they don't know what to expect when you're audited, the sort of things you have to bring to the table and how much money it costs. So you have a situation where you have one camp blaming the other or each camp's blaming the other. And I think some sort of standards and what the rules are to undergo one of these things would be immensely helpful. That's great. So I think before I continue on with uh, my questions, I would like to take the opportunity to open it up uh, because we only have 25 more minutes left in this 
very interesting panel on this really fast moving topic. So I know people um, could benefit from the expertise we have on the panel. So I don't want to just keep um, monopolizing it and I'd just like to open it up and see if anyone has any questions. Um, it looks like uh, Dwayne has a question. Please proceed. Yeah, thank, thank you, Amy. Um, Jeff, kind of following up on your last point, I, I am interested, Amy, from your vantage point, and, and if, if you don't have the vantage point, you know, let, let us know. But uh, I am interested in that, that question about is there a capacity in the profession to deal with all of this? You know, has the profession caught up from a capacity standpoint? And my understanding is that the, the big four with their bigger public clients Public clients, you know, bigger banks and things weren't getting into crypto in material ways until maybe more recently. So the big four weren't, and their biggest, most complex clients weren't necessarily spending as much focus on on crypto. So were you developing that expertise, and were or were crypto companies going to smaller firms? And you know, I'm just kind of curious how you look about across the profession what your view is of the capacity to really because I think Jeff's raising an important, you know, an interesting point there. Yeah, no, I, I think it's an important, um, important point. Um, I would say from a from a working group perspective, and of course, the folks on the working group are, are the folks that are very passionate about the space and have been investing a lot of time and energy into the space over the last I think four years we've we've had the digital assets working group of the AICPA. Um, our focus has been the importance of skill sets and developing um, the skill sets of our people to understand what the unique risks are, what the new unique forms of evidence are, and how we can um, perform quality audits um, as this space continues to emerge and change um, over time. I think that gets at the fundamentals of a preconditions of an audit. Um, we, we think about if we have the right skill sets before we ever take it on. And so while I, I agree, I think the big firms have been investing in, in this space for a period of time. I mean, I can't speak for, for all the firms, but I, I do think that everybody needs to think about if we have the right skill sets before we take on, um, take on an audit and, and who's going to be actually performing the work. And I, and I guess as a follow up, uh, maybe to Doug. Is the pipeline are, are are the is the education system uh, gearing up for this as well so that or or is it more the apprenticeship model still uh, that that we're relying on systemically? I think for cryptocurrency certainly it's uh, the educational arm is is, is not geared up. Uh, the focus is on. Uh, data analytics and similar advanced audit tools. Uh, it's probably going to take a little while uh, for uh, cryptocurrencies to get uh, more attention in the curriculum. But on the other hand, it's probably never been the case that uh, the accounting and, and the few auditing courses in uh, the curriculums uh, have been able to devote attention to specific industries. I mean, some industries are hot and uh, individual instructors will be using those as examples because students' uh, interest goes up uh, when, when the topic is uh, something, something that, that's in the press and people are very interested in. But uh, I don't think in any systematic way uh, the the kinds of skill sets that would be needed, uh, particularly for auditing crypto uh, currencies, are are in the cards in the curriculum right now. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, question and those answers, Christina. Do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, this is very interesting. And before I ask my question, I just want to caveat that I am looking out from my window, so. My question could be just really dreaming here. Um, so Jeff mentioned that blockchain uh, information is public. Um, and, and I also understand that there isn't like data standard for blockchain. So one blockchain and next to the other, they're different. Um, do you think since the data is public, um, is this, an area where it's conceivable 
that if, if there were some kind of data standard underlying that that investor could have a direct role of validating information without relying on assurance from auditors. Mm -hmm. or, or a different set of group of people who could provide that kind of service. I mean, I think that was the original vision of Bitcoin. Like if I send Amy some Bitcoin and you want to see it's gone through, I can point to sort of a, you know, a hash on the blockchain showing it's right there. So obviously it got sort of, you know, complicated because people move it to, you know, to wallets around the world. But, you know, these forensic companies like Chainalysis can, cha can trace all of those hops. The problem is reading a blockchain is not very easy. And there's software things like Etherscan that scans Ethereum blockchain or Bitcoin Explorer, but still, you know, that's supposed to be kind of a more normy thing and it's not easy, but I think increasingly companies are building the UX to make this sort of software a lot more digestible, just like the stock market spits out like trillions of pieces of data a day. And, you know, sites like Yahoo Finance and stuff bring it together in a comprehensible way. Increasingly, platforms are being built to be able to read blockchains in that, in that sort of way. You know, that said, if you want to you know, do something nefarious to the blockchain, you probably can, but you can't reverse it. You can't tamper with it. That's the, that's the distinct feature of a blockchain. It's immutable and irreversible in the case of the major ones, you know, more, you know, sort of newer blockchains, be careful. You know, if there's someone controls it or, you know, there could be security risk that can be hacked, but the major blockchains, you know, that's their, their distinct quality. And I think it'll get easier to read them going forward. Thank you. Can I piggyback on Christina's question? But you had said earlier, I think something about that's fine. It, it, you can see the assets are there, but maybe they have pledged them. Um, is is that a hole wherein maybe the investor could see that the that the entity owned some um, some asset on the technology and they could trace it, but then they they don't see that the pledging of it uh, as collateral somewhere, or is that also recorded on the blockchain as well? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I, I mean, I think because you guys pledge things by contract, right? Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, ways to leverage this thing and maybe an exchange is letting you lever it up. And that's probably not going to, you know, maybe an exchange, offshore exchange is supplying you the ability to lever whatever, whatever asset you have. Um, and it's harder, you know, given a lot of these things are rooted in like the Cayman Islands or the Bahamas or something. So um, I think, yeah, there, that's where the sort of chicanery is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and also be aware of in-house tokens like FTX created FTT, which it was saying, oh, this is, you know, necessary to operate our blockchain. It's really useful. And in reality, few, it was at best like airline reward sort of thing. And they were able to, through wash trading, it's really prevalent in blockchain too, because you want to get attention. You set up two wallets, it's really easy to wash trade with yourself and sort of fabricate volume. That's something else to be careful of. I mean, it could almost be a separate, you know, webinar on the nature of scams and stuff like that. So I don't realize that's really, that wasn't really an answer to your question, but yeah. There is still some unknowable things, and the big one is, has something been collateralized? Um, and how do you create an accounting standard? Yes, because you can find the, the money in the blockchain, but, you know, has it, has it been pledged to something else? And that's something I think Binance is currently fumbling towards getting that done. But as we saw, you know, that sort of, you know, debacle where they hired Mazars in South Africa to go and create an audit. And then, the, you know, the auditor was like, well, this kind of looks okay on the surface. And then they quietly took it down five days later, either from reputational risk or I'm not sure why, but obviously we have a way to go on that front. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so we have a couple more hands up. Parveen, you're next. And then Alicia, you're, you're after Parveen. Okay, um, thank you, Amy. So about three weeks ago, there was a major meeting by Berkshire Hathaway and Charlie Munger, uh, you know, who is a legendary investor, and this is investor advisory group meeting we are talking about. I'm gonna read you something that has made headlines several times. So quote, and of course, I'm not proud of my country for allowing this crap, dash, well, comma, I call it crypto, S-H-I-T. It's worthless, it is crazy, it's not good, it will do nothing but harm, it's antisocial to allow it. Charlie Munger said this on February 15th in an open shareholders meeting 
And uh, if a legendary investor of that repute is thinking so low about crypto, I'm wondering, and if you take into account the previous panel, we haven't been able to solve the problems of detecting fraud. Is this area really auditable? And what can be done in order to really protect the investors and all what the PCOB can do to protect the investors when the investor sentiment is so strong, when a person of his repute talks like this uh, and something blows up, and FTX is a great example, I think auditors and the PCOB and everybody else is going to be blamed whether we like it or not. What's the reaction of the panelists on that? Anyone want that hot potato? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll take that one, but I would like to hear from the other panelists. I mean, Charlie Munger's 99 years old and made his money on bank stocks. And I think we have to, you know, realize this sort of political forces at work they're playing out right now, because right now you're seeing Liz Warren, who's basically, you know, the Biden administration's sort of financial go-to person who really dislikes crypto. There's something like akin to a moral panic going on right now. And this sort of rhetoric of like it, you know, crypto shit and stuff like that, that's not new. I mean, uh, Jamie, you know, Warren Buffett five years ago called it rat poison squared. And, you know, Jamie Dimon said he'd fire anyone who trades in it. But look, JP Morgan's also has a thriving blockchain unit. So part of this is it's a disruptive technology that's aimed squarely at the financial sector. So I think the incumbents, just like once upon a time when the internet came about, there was, you know, ferocious foot, foot pushback from the music music industry and the publishing industry who want to characterize it all as a criminal scheme. And so, I mean, I think just kind of take a grain of salt in either way. No, it's not like the, you know, this, you know, the second coming of the Messiah, Web3 isn't going to set you free and all that crap, but nor do I think is it rat poison squared. I mean, I think there's rhetorical, a lot of rhetoric on both sides. We have to look at, you know, sort of, you know, the, the underlying self-interest on each side. You know, I'd say that the, the auditing profession has generally dealt with that kind of thing through client acceptance and, and decided whether a firm is going to be uh, associated with a particular industry or not. And, and uh, I, I think it, it, the general philosophy that, that uh, uh, Munger was talking to is, is probably outside the auditor's purview. All right, um, let's turn it to Alicia for her question. And then after that, we'll go to Lynn. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of the panelists for a really interesting perspective on this, uh, on, on, on this topic, on, this, on these emerging assets. Um, Amy, given uh, your description of, of your day job as well as your committee work, may I ask you a question based on some conversation that was had in the previous panel, which you may not have uh, been been listening to, but the gist of it, if I could summarize it from my perspective, was that there's a gap perhaps between what the auditors are doing in terms of whether it's opining on a set of financial statements or uh, providing a, a service auditor's report or a similar such uh, such document, and what the reader of that financial statement is um, is taking away from that. From your from your vantage point, do you have a perspective on sort of what you think is happening in terms of the consumers of these reports? And uh, just to add on to that, yesterday the PCAOB issued a statement, an investor advisory, um, exercise caution with third party verification proof of reserve reports. I know this isn't a service auditor's report, but it is one of the more specialized type of types of reports, as I understand it, that the audit, that many audit firms have been providing. Could you just help kind of understand this whole area, please? So if you if you might, I could try, Alicia, and and I was not on the on the prior panel, but um, or I was not able to listen to it. I did read the. The alert from yesterday, um, and I was going to bring up proof of reserves, that term, and that goes back to my earlier comment about there's lots of different terms um, in this area that mean different things to different people. Um, I mean, I think as it relates to, to the alert and broadly in the space, 
communication and clarity is really needed. Um, I think there's a lot of new business models, new services, whether it's stock reports on, on a custodian of digital assets or it's proof of reserve on a stable coin or it's proof of exchange on an exchange. There's a lot of different terms that mean different things and there could be um, challenges for users of these reports. I and mean, we absolutely recognize that it's, it could be challenging for users to understand, well, what am I getting? What's the level of assurance here? Um, and that's critical. And I think with, with audits of financial statements, we take that for granted that users of those reports have been using them for a long time and they know what an audit is and what an audit is not. They know they're getting reasonable assurance. And when we have a new emerging area with new emerging services, um, clarity and transparency in the reports is so critical so that users know what they're getting and what they're not. Um, I think um, proof of reserve is a very um, challenging term. There's a lot that could go under that. We have um, or there are um, engagements out there where it's regulatory compliance. So where a state regulator has come up with criteria that management is measuring against and auditors are auditing to, those in my opinion are very different than um, a proof of reserve where management's establishing the criteria. And in both of those instances, it really comes down to the transparency of the reports and the disclosures so users know what they're getting until we get to a point where it's more mainstream and there's regulation that defines the rules of the road so everybody's operating under the same um, under the same umbrella. So I think um, right now, in the meantime, there is a demand for, for trust and transparency. I do think auditors play a critical role in trust and transparency. I think management reports also play a role here and disclosures are absolutely critical. Um, I think continuing to work together, um, regulators, standard setters, auditors, management, investors, to really understand what is the need? What, what do investors need? And then how can we get very clear rules so that um, we're able to have the same rules to the road and be able to give reports that everybody understands what it is and what it's not just like people are used to today with um, audits of historical financial statements. Did that answer your question, Alicia? It, it does. It's actually helpful. Thank you. May I, may I just do a quick follow up, Amy? Yeah. Um, Go for when, it. And pardon my ignorance, but when was when was the last time that the AICPA would have undertaken a survey to understand from the users of the various information that audit firms produce or that the accounting standards uh, are, are utilized for that the users are finding relevant? I'm not aware. I, I, I don't know that I would have that, that knowledge. You're saying a survey to ask users what they want as far as reports? I, I'm not sure to be honest with okay. you, but I, I was just curious as to sort of what kind of um, process that 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 an entity like the AICPA, who puts out all of these accounting standards, who uh, also you know includes audit standards and, and guides this 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 such an important profession, uh, in terms of what kind of feedback necessarily may be coming back at them in terms and and therefore input to their process. I, I was curious to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I could speak toward the working group from a working group perspective. We're not issuing accounting or auditing standards. We're interpreting current standards today to be able to help with well, how would you take current standards that exist through um, through the what's already out there and interpret that to a new class of um, a class of service. So it's not we're not creating any authoritative guidance. It's all non authoritative interpretations. I understood and and uh, I, I wasn't intending to put you on the spot. I was I was yeah. I was trying to take advantage of your perspective, given your involvement in in uh, in these adjacent activities. Thank you. Yeah, but I do think, I mean, your point on understanding what users want is absolutely critical. I mean, I think that's that's where um, really getting getting it together, investors use um, other users of the report management standard setters to really understand what's the demand and then how do we fill that demand and go through the due process to be able to come up with with standards that are clear. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, thanks, Alicia, for the question and Amy for the response. Lynn, I think you'll be our last question, and uh, then I'll turn it back over to Saba. Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> Amy, you mentioned about trust, and auditors can play a role in that trust. 
but there's been newspaper articles and to some extent the uh, Warren Brown letter that indicated the uh, profession so far has been more of uh, cheerleaders rather than a trusted public watchdog. And I say that obviously in light of what happened at FTX and some of the others that have collapsed, but also uh, the profession wasn't overly supportive of the SEC on SAB 121, which brought all these custodian assets on the balance sheet. Thank goodness uh, now that the SEC actually had done that. There was guidance that was in the AICPA task force white paper in particular on question 25, where task force put out guidance that was supported by the industry and again, just as with SAB 121, the SEC chief accountant had to step in. And as you know, last December said that guidance doesn't work. So the paper had to get taken down and, and put back out. We've seen the proof of reserves done by the firms and now those have been pulled back down. Why should an investor in light of that uh, uh, be less concerned uh, or not concerned about the cheerleading in this situation and feel that uh, or have a belief that in fact these audits will put the investor front and center and their best interest at the heart of the auditor versus what we've seen so far and the other one was by the way was micro strategy a little over a year ago as you probably know they came out with accounting to Jeff's point. They were using the intangible model that didn't make any sense whatsoever. Again, the SEC and chief accountant had to step in and say, no, that's not acceptable. And Mike, Michael Saylor, who one might say is a repeat offender, <clears throat> had to go back and take huge loss, uh, losses, which impacted investors as well. So really, why should investors think that the auditors are going to place their best interest first and foremost. Um, I want to take that quickly. I know we're out of time, but I don't think having standardized accounting practices amounts to cheerleading. You know, there's other industries like cannabis or online sports gambling. You might think smoking weed's wrong. You might not like gambling, but I'm not sure how investors are served if you refuse to audit those professions. You know, I think you have to focus on the good actors like Coinbase and Circle, who've got some really top flight, you know, former SEC people, judges, lawyers trying to figure this out. Yeah, there's no shortage of you know charlatans and scammers but i don't think investors gain anything if there's no standardized accounting practices and experts like you all you know don't step in to help and say what it should look like i would tend to disagree jeff if the answers that they come up with don't reflect the best interest of investors nor fair reality enough. fair enough i'm just saying transparency and standardization is usually good but i take your point Does anyone else have a, if they want to speak to Lynn's question? Well, just, just going back to the proof of reserves reports, the, the notion that an auditor would give any impression that an agreed upon procedures engagement was an audit uh, is, is just uh, really terrible. So I think the, the, uh, alert that was issued warning about proof of reserves reports uh, was uh, a good service to investors. The agreed upon procedures engagements don't make any sense at all, uh, uh, except in that one circumstance that Amy mentioned of when there's a regulator that specified the procedures. But for the, the investor to try to make sense of what kind of assurance they're getting from procedures that management and the auditor have agreed on just doesn't make any sense at all. Great, I don't see any additional questions in the queue, um, but I think Saba has said we could spend a couple more minutes if anyone has any um, 
questions that they would like to pose to our esteemed panelists, please feel free to just take yourself off mute and ask. Amy, I don't see any hands up. So I think with that, I would like to say thank you and thank you to our panelists for taking the time to speak on this very important topic. It was a great discussion and I hope everyone learned a lot from it. So thank you. The final presentation of the day is the work of the IAG subcommittee on inspections and data transparency. The presentation focuses on how to enhance the PCOB's inspections process for the benefit of investors. Panelists include Elizabeth Mooney, Professor Nemat Shiroff, and my PCOB colleague, George Borek. Alicia Damley will moderate the, the session. Inspections serve as a very important tool in the PCOB's toolbox to protect investors, and we're looking forward to hearing the panel's perspective. So with that, I'll hand it over to Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Saba. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel on the uh, on how we can uh, better inform or share our perspective uh, for the PCAOB in and around the inspections process. Um, as you can see from uh, the esteemed panelists' bios, we have uh, sought to have different perspectives in terms of what each of these three individuals are bringing to the table. Uh, by way of background, uh, I actually straddle the world of uh, auditing and investing. I started my career in public accounting and uh, shifted into uh, investment management by side specifically. And as an analyst and investor, it, it did not occur to me when I was in the public accounting profession, how valuable those skills are and would be as I moved into the investor uh, framework. And I was struck by um, the panel, not the last one, but the one before around this whole issue of what is it that we're, we're getting in the financial statements, that entire audit process, the quality of the audit and how that informs the output and my reliance as an investor and an analyst on that information. So with that little bit of background, um, let me move into our panel. Uh, we've uh, agreed between the subcommittee as well as our panelists that we, were, we are uh, seeking to, hold, uh, to engage with this panel as a conversation. Uh, we invite your questions either through the Q&A, uh, but we will seek to address them specifically uh, towards the end of the conversation. So to that end, about 45 minutes uh, for the, the panelist conversation with some time left over for questions before we conclude the panel. So as a starting point uh, to sort of just set the stage to begin our discussion, uh, thought that the first question that I might want to pose, or we might want to pose, pardon me, because this was a collective effort of the subcommittee, is for each of the panelists to share their perspective on the importance of accounting and or audit quality uh, to your efforts and or research interests, please. Elizabeth, you're, right, you're at the top of my screen. Would you like to start, please? Sure, sure. Thanks. And thanks for having me here today. It's really an honor to be with this, uh, this important group fighting for investors um, on an important area. So we're a fundamental research uh, based investment firm capital group. And my responsibilities are accounting research globally um, for alongside our analysts and portfolio managers. Um, we've got several hundred and uh, and I've got, we've got a team, several of us here actually working on accounting research. So, yeah, as investors, we really rely heavily on um, the financial reporting data and really want it to be the highest quality wherever we're investing. And so the audits and audit quality are really foundational, um, but we're in the dark and just unable to conduct research analysis of the audit for making the investment decisions. Um, feeling more confidence in the numbers we're using. So um, it's a pretty simple answer to that to that first question. Uh, so I think, yeah, I'll turn it over to who's next. Nemet, I lost Hi. you on my screen. 
Thanks, Lishan, and thanks, Arvind, for that for that answer. Uh, I'd just like to thank Amy and uh, and Saba and and Parvin as well, you know, for putting this panel together. Uh, um, so, so just to to give a short answer, Alicia, I mean, accounting is clearly important for both allocating capital across companies and even within companies. Uh, and accounting disclosures, one company can even help other related companies with their capital allocation through spillovers, you know. Uh, so there's an abundance of high quality academic evidence supporting the idea uh, that financial accounting improves capital allocation in, in many, many ways. Uh, certainly audit quality matters too. Better quality audits help companies raise capital on more favorable terms. However, let me add that uh, it is not clear how a non-expert could differentiate between a high versus low or low quality audit. Uh, in, in my opinion, financial statement audits are a credence good, uh, which means the quality of the, of, of the audit is difficult for non-experts non to observe, uh, even at companies that purchase the audit. It's, 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 I mean, just like it'd be difficult for someone to evaluate the quality of a surgeon after having undergone one, say, say a heart surgery, it's difficult to evaluate the quality of uh, an audit, even if the company has just undergone one. Uh, and, and this is why I think the, the PCOB inspections of audit firms and the disclosure of the inspection reports play a crucial role in informing investors of audit quality and ensuring that uh, audit firms are held to a, a minimum standard uh, when performing uh, audits of public companies. Thank you for sharing that nuance. Um, quite important, especially given some of our earlier, what some of our earlier panelists have also commented. George. Yes, Alicia, good afternoon. Pleasure to be with everyone. Thank you for the, the invitation. Um, before I begin, just let me, uh, like Barb did, give our quick disclaimer that the views I express are my own and do not like represent those of the board, individual board members or other staff at the PCOB. Um, I think it's, uh, it's interesting. It's a great question. It's interesting that we're all three aligned on this. I think most folks will be aligned when you think about the importance of uh, very simply of of quality financial reporting, uh, quality of the audit of of um, accounting in general. Because as was said, I think a couple times in different ways, but that represents the bedrock of our capital markets, our capital markets system. You know, financial reporting uh, provides decision quality information for either current or potential investors, lenders, creditors, and other users of the financial um, statements and the financial reporting process, um, high quality, reliable, relevant information really serves as the hallmark, again, of our capital markets and the capital system. Um, but then it does beg the question, well, how does all this work? How does it all come together? And I think that's where the, 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 the fork in the road comes with the financial statement auditor. And the role that the financial statement auditor plays, you know, as a gatekeeper, as it's called, um, has been called probably at least since the 1933-1934 Securities Exchange Acts. The role that the financial statement auditor plays is, is critical because it allows the investor, um, even with, you know, Nemeth, to your point, may not be perfect information, but does allow the investor to rely on those financial results um, because of the work that the auditor provides. And ultimately, that supports the efficient you know, allocation of capital um, investments across our systems. Um, now, that does bring into into the picture quickly now the PCOB and the work that we do in our inspections. Um, and just a couple quick data points. Um, last year in 2022, we inspected across all of our all of our programs um, over 200 firms and reviewed over 800 audits across all of our work. Um, as we've said in, in other contexts, the number of comment forms that we issued last year in 2022 is up from the prior year in 2021 and the number of audit files that have at least one comment form associated with them is also up, which is quite concerning relative to the foundation of the quality of the audit, coming back to the basic question, uh, audit quality, if you will. Um, and and I'll, I'll make one more point, at least, and I'll hand it back to you, is, is I've kind of said in other contexts, I think of audit quality as oxygen. Uh, when it's present, um, the significance of it isn't appreciated, but as soon as um, it leaves the space, we all know something's missing. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pause Alicia and um, hand it back to you. Thank you, George. Uh, I'll just mention briefly uh, at the at our subcommittee meeting when we were discussing this first question, uh, I raised the point as to I wondered whether we might find anyone who would say differently than what our three panelists have commented. But mind you, 
you know, in, in some respects, we're coming from a shared space in terms of our respective value of audited information, financial statements, the accounting standards, et cetera. But it, I couldn't help but think that it would have made for a very different discussion if we actually had someone on the panel who thought differently. Uh, so moving into that, and, 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 and Nemeth, thank you for um, kind of bringing in that nuance around uh, capital raising and the importance uh, of uh, audit quality within that context. Maybe we could uh, peel the onion, peel some more layers of that onion and take a look to see from an investor perspective, what else or how else does audit quality essentially inform, affect, or guide um, their decision-making process? And so, so currently, really, we don't have much information to to evaluate audit quality, right? Like, I I, I like what uh, I'll have to use uh, George's quote at some point, uh, but uh, audit quality being like the oxygen in, in the room, uh, it's uh, you don't observe it until there's a there's a big problem, until there's a big fraud, right? So, uh, I think I think part of it is just that we need more information about uh, about audit quality, about about ways in which we can evaluate audit quality. And currently, we don't have much. Um, the uh, the I think leading into this, the the in the in the first panel, we talked about how uh, it would help if there was more disclosure provided, right? Even if it was not timely, if there's information about work papers, there's information about who conducts the audit, the audit, the people, the personnel conducting the audit. Uh, if all of that was disclosed, but even with significant delay. Uh, a few several years later, uh, I think that can have an effect uh, to to make auditors more more uh, to supply a higher quality audit in, on on a ex ante basis. Like you know, knowing that this information will come out at a later date can change behavior up front. And and I think uh, just just more information is needed to evaluate audit quality. Elizabeth, how how has this affected your work, or could you share a little bit more detail about the kind of uh, the way in which capital is specifically looking to include these types of uh, this type of detail? Yeah, I, I, thanks, and no, I, mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, the assumption in the question is that we do an assessment of audit quality, but right now, um, as Emmett mentioned, yeah, we get no data uh, or information whatsoever. So. It, we can't really assess it, so nothing is made available at all. Um, and I think this lacking transparency, you know, prevents us from really rallying behind the investors when there's a problem, because um, we just have nothing to go on, and we're really left wondering where were the auditors. And we're seeing that question appear in short reports. Um, we just ha we can't defend them. We can't really rally behind them. And I guess in terms of decision making, I mean, we want to avoid losses, of course, and good gatekeeping and sunlight can help deter that. Um, we want to have more educated conversations and research of companies and, and votes. So um, there's certainly obviously the use case. Um, and in terms of timeliness, uh, when information is just delayed at, at some point, and these are very delayed um, in terms of inspection reports already, but it's just, uh, I guess it's better recently for sure. It's been getting better, so thanks to the board um, and staff. Anyway, uh, when information is delayed, it's just ignored if, if not worthless at that point. And worst case, you know, risk builds up and uh, stocks mispriced. But, uh, anyhow, I think just having the inspection reports like shortly after the audit, and uh, we'll go. We can go into more more info detail on that. Um, but the uh, you know certainly at the company level would make it much more relevant uh, for investors. And it just this data needs to be accessible. Um, your question was about availability. I mean, we like all of our data really that we use. We can pull it up, we can search it, we can um, download it into the, our models. Um, so just like having to look at the paper PDF or the, uh, and then manually transfer it or enter it or, or be able to look at it is just not something we do anymore. So, yeah. Understood. Uh, you know, clearly the PCAOB is supportive 
of providing data. Uh, in fact, George, I would suggest that on the website, there are the PCAOB takes the time to highlight various um, academic papers and, and research reports that are supportive of and excuse me, that have analyzed information that the PCAOB has provided up until now. And importantly, the value, the positive value for investors coming out of that. Could you comment please on, on, uh, on that? Yes, Alicia, um, it's, it's a good question. Certainly, um, Elizabeth, appreciate your, your perspectives and comments. Um, I think, but broad, let me start broad. It's a broad statement. You know, we've been thinking a lot, working with our board, certainly the strategic plan, plan itself calls out you know, greater transparency. I think in a broad statement, the investor advisory statement is one example that just came out yesterday in terms of how we're thinking in an expanded way about transparency um, from an inspection report perspective. Um, and again, Elizabeth, appreciate your comments. We have been working very hard to try to increase the timeliness of those reports. And that's something that um, we never rest on, if you will, quite literally, that we're that you sit here today trying to increase the speed of reports coming out. And I, I think I can say, personally, I'm optimistic you'll see that um, coming out um, beginning in the next um, you know, matter of a couple months, probably, um, from where we've been in prior years. So that is something that um, we remain steadfast in, in terms of increasing transparency and the speed. Um, whether it's through our website or through through other means such as the alerts that have come out spotlight documents we're also very much focused on those uh, that are current events as well as inspection specific items um, but it all I think comes back to Alicia if I may you know the, 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 the quality of the the audit the quality of the financial reporting again being the foundational uh, of the third party assurance process as a system that we have that the auditors perform um, and in, I think when we think about audit quality, at least from an inspection perspective, and, and the kind of drivers of audit quality, um, you know, some are broad, such as the history of the firm, the tone at the top, the culture that a firm might have, how does that impact audit quality, as well as you know, things that are much maybe more mundane, the experience of the engagement team, um, their expertise, their technical skills, the training re regiment the firm has in place, uh, supervision review, the technical skills, as well as methodology, so all that, Kind of comes together almost in a crucible, if you will, to, to to at the end of the day result in either either high quality auditing or something less than that. But but it's a multifaceted question that ultimately gets to the quality. And then from a PCOB perspective, to come back full circle, you know, we're thinking of ways that we can increase the transparency through our inspection work, either through the reports or even through remediation, um, as well as other means um, that we have at our disposal to provide information to investors in a timely manner. I was struck by one particular uh, research report. I think this was one that was highlighted on the PCAOB's website, which talked about the fact that more organizational level deficiencies, the firm appears less efficient based on more hours worked to, with no change in audit fees and worse audit quality and audit efficiencies of a more practical nature, the firm appears to not spend enough time. Uh, I believe that's a 2019 uh, research report. So. There's there's data from based on what the PCAOB has collected so far, which can potentially help the audit firms themselves. Is there not? I, we the, think, yeah, I think that we do have information. Again, speaking for myself on our website um, and through our reports. And I think for me, if you take it from a firm perspective, um, we're interacting with the when I say we inspections in particular are interacting with the firms, the major firms on a fairly ongoing basis. So. Through the inspection of the files, the, the interaction with the engagement team that we're inspecting, as well as our comment form process. Um, if we have a comment form and the response to the comment form, through that back and forth, you know, to your point, the firms um, I think are well aware whether they agree or disagree, ultimately they're well aware of where we're coming from and how we're thinking about the, the quality of their work and the observation that we're raising. So from that perspective, the firms I think it's fair to say are well aware of the points that we're trying to make and how they can then respond to improve their audit quality as needed. Is there still resistance with sharing more information about these audit inspections? Well, I think, well, resistance in the sense of we're, we're, we're always thinking of ways to, I mean, literally almost as we sit here today, I can, can assure you, we're thinking of ways to provide more information to investors through our inspection reports. Um, in particular, um, but also other ways, you know, maybe on the website, the, some of the points you've alluded to, um, whether it be data, whether it be better accessibility to to be able to find inspection reports, we're thinking about a number of things along that line that we think will be helpful ultimately 
to investors and other other users, but also just our, our inspection reports. And and you know, I think it's fair to say that probably in the coming months, um, board members, um, staff will be able to communicate more about um, changes to our reports that we're anticipating. We think will be will be helpful down this path of increased transparency. Thank you. We look forward to receiving that uh, that type of update, George, because I think there's a lot of investors or or broadly stakeholders who 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 look forward to that information. And 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 just to um, just for fuller disclosure, you know, one of the things has been around ease of access. Uh, Elizabeth alluded to that uh, ease of access to the data, you know, away from the paper form, away from the PDF form, into a searchable database. And and it's not just investors speaking as a audit committee chair or past audit committee chair or audit committee member uh, or an investment committee member for that matter. You know, that is valuable. There's a lot of very valuable information if made available in a searchable form could be extremely helpful. With that wonderful segue that George just gave us, perhaps we can talk about, you know, what what are the if we had a wish list, right? What would be at the top of our list in terms of the kind of information that would be helpful uh, for the investor process? Or uh, uh, Elizabeth, perhaps you can you can start us off on this discussion. Sure. Um, so I think three overriding. Um, points or areas, I mean, one, what we were just saying, I mean, we really do need the inspection data in a searchable database where we can, you know, download it and um, look at the company. So we need the company, an identifier with the companies. Um, we can only get this kind of stuff from the SEC filings, like audit fees or partner name, or, you know, we can get SEC correspondence. We really need it for the PCOB filings and inspections as well. Um, so a searchable database uh, that would really make um, a huge, huge difference for I think the investors to rally behind the auditors and the and the PCOB as well and all the good work. Um, but we need the audit quality indicators that are comparable across the companies and across time. So you know I think PCOB's you know due process and bringing that to bear um, would really help ensure that we get good audit quality indicators, and that is the term that's used globally, um, audit quality indicator. I think right now there's a more of an audit-centric term that's being used, like about engagement, the audit engagement. But anyway, the, we as investors, we look at indicators, key performance indicators, compensation type of indicators, audit quality indicators is like a logical extension of that for really the best data we get. Um, is around that the audited data so th that is what we how we think about it audit quality indicators and again we want those kind of comparable with a standardized um, you know standard for how to how to how to measure those um, and it's just really I guess striking that none of this audit quality data that PCOB has is available to us we really have zero information I know we've, we've talked about that already but um, we can't audit the quality right now. I mean, it's not just a, a you know a gap. It just doesn't exist right now for us. So, um, you know, the audit committees uh, from talking to them, and uh, you know, we we do understand that they receive audit quality indicators uh, sometimes. And I really I agree with the letter this group wrote that um, you know the. That the metric about the metrics, I thought it was an outstanding letter. Kudos to you to, to this group uh, in January where you talked about, um, you know, it, it was on quality controls where we talked about quality of audits and everything. Everything you wrote there it was a great letter. But um, but yeah, so <clears throat> the same metrics should be required to be disclosed to the audit committees and to investors at the issuer level. And also we would really find use in having it at the audit firm city level. So um, I know some other investors have talked about that in some of their comment letters as well as yours, and that um, would be super useful. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of specific metrics, you, you all have thought a lot about that, and I, I'm happy to kind of go over what would be, what data would be supportive to your question, but, um, I didn't know if you wanted me. You want to do that right now. Um, I, I don't know, or we can come back to that. But I have taken some time to really think about, look at your letter, and also just think about how we're, what we're doing, and what would be really useful um, to have in that searchable database. 
that we would use. Uh, Elizabeth, please continue, and then I will come back to Nemet, who can can share his uh -huh. perspective. Okay, so um, you know the inspection findings for each issuer, um, and the, obviously the auditor, um, the tenure, and the fees paid um, to the firms by an issuer, uh, as well as the total fees of each city office this would be really helpful and the inspection reports by city office, like I mentioned. But those those would really help to contextualize and I would expect CCOB is also looking at this for, um, you know, in an auditor independence review what that relative uh, materiality is. But, uh, you know, the partner name of each year and historically, because we do find um, that partners switch off and go back and forth um, when when we do look at what data is on the site in the searchable database, which we use right now as um, much as we can, but we do see partners kind of switching back and forth periodically, just swapping places on engagements or um, one year they just rotate each year, they go keep going back and forth, which you you would think would be kind of an independent flag. Um, and also just having the reason in there for any early rotation of a partner would be super useful. Um, we learned uh, one large corporation, yeah, recently had their normal audit partner rotation and um, proposed rotating back to the prior partner, who is great. There's not an issue with that partner, but the corporation asked for a, a list of capable partners and chose one from a totally different part of the country, actually, of the same audit firm. But the big four firm really went ballistic. I mean, it was a huge, huge kerfuffle. Like the corporate, it really opened the eyes of the corporation exactly what a big deal it is and the pressure on the partners and the city office to keep an audit. So um, we just thought that was really a striking um, conversation and example. So sometimes we, yeah, we find that an audit partner actually lives and works in a city, state, or office different from the city, state, or office where they're signing the opinion, and we can't really understand that fact pattern or what's driving it. Um, so just having a little bit more around uh, information, or, or uh, I guess maybe it's not yet on the Form AP, but, you know, some of these, you know, not just that, that there was a change, but like why it happened early or, or what, you know, that kind of thing would be helpful. Um, and or why why there's a disconnect basically in like where they live and where they're actually working and where they're actually signing. And we would have a very keen interest, like I mentioned, in compensation metrics. We look at this for all the companies and um, audit partner, obviously compensation performance metrics would be super useful, uh, again, around um, auditor independence and audit quality. The restatement and enforcement actions history um, also would be helpful to have flat in there tagged the presence of an arbitration clause. Uh, we that comes up in our conversations. Um, you know, people feel kind of over a barrel that they have to agree to that. It's very hard not to, not to. Uh, and there's certainly some of the big four that really force that in there and. Um, yeah, so at least flagging that that is uh, present. And uh, I guess ref the referred work area, I know there's been a lot of progress there, but with to which offices and which specialists and percent of fees and there was this whole area of referred work because it really muddies the analysis when like there's a, a say an inspected office that signed the opinion, but they've actually referred it to a non-inspected office, especially for you know foreign private issuers, it's uh, it's really hard to tell. That would be helpful to know what that what that is, and for all U.S. issuers, the percent uh, role played by a Chinese audit firm affiliate. Again, whether or not that Chinese audit, the affiliate was hired by the U.S. firm or by a foreign firm, we just what it's referred out there and what the percentage of the audit, and then. Um, you know, another a bonus right now that's not required, and I don't, I don't know if this is PCOB's um, 
jurisdiction or or whatever, you know, if it would make more sense to FTC, but you're focused quite a bit on audit committees, so it would be very helpful to know if these audit committees have public accounting expertise or somehow have that. That is in nowhere in any database. The bios are, you know, really hit or miss and it's hard to pick up and that's an important kind of oversight. So, you know, the, I guess those are my, my main points if you wanted the detail. Uh, you know, in, in conclusion, you know, please start providing audit quality indicators to investors as soon as possible without delay. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's a terrific amount of granularity. And it's funny that you talk about sort of, you know, trying to determine a expertise of the audit committee members, because you literally have to do a bio search word by word looking for keywords, uh, though I'm starting to see sort of those, um, uh, those templates show up with, you know, different types of competencies and, and how each person hits, but I, I don't know who's made that assessment. Somebody has somewhere. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, Nemet, you yourself are, have a fair amount of research interest in this area. Could you share your thoughts, please? Uh, so I thought Elizabeth did a great job actually covering many of the things that uh, that one should look at. You know, I mean, these these are clearly these is uh, I mean, what what she's asked for. I think this is exactly the type of things we'll need to actually just unpack the audit, right? Because currently it's a black box, uh, so we just know very little. Uh, two additional things that I'll I'll add to to what she said is is uh, one is she really data on audit adjustments. Uh, I've said this before in previous meetings. Uh, uh, so, what are audit adjustments? I mean, this is the difference between the pre-audited and the audited financial financial amounts, such as sales and assets. So, you can have what were what was sales as prepared by, say, the, the company uh, by the issuer, uh, and then what the audited sales were. So, what were the adjustments that came about as the result of the uh, the audit process? And, and this. These audit adjustments are perhaps the most direct information related to uh, the financial statement changes that resulted from the audit. Uh, none of these indicators can be interpreted on their own. You know, so everything requires some nuance. Everything requires uh, everything is to be interpreted collect collectively. And I feel like data and audit, audit adjustments do exist. It's it's uh, it's collected by the PCOB, I believe. Well, so that is something that I think would be uh, particularly useful. Uh, the other really important thing, in addition to everything that Elspeth said, was uh, is really audit hours. You know, what was the amount of time that auditors actually spent on a certain engagement? And, and part of the reason why I think this is helpful would be, uh, currently we have data on audit fees, which is useful, but the interpretation of fees is again nuanced, you know, because audit firms charge the fees as a function of two things, largely speaking, I mean, the many things, but there are two, two primary determinants of fees is, uh, the amount of time that auditors actually put in to the engagement and the other is the risk associated with that engagement. Uh, so if we have the amount of time that they put in to the engagement, uh, the premium that's charged over and above uh, that time is, it, it gives you a sense for risk. Of course, the amount of time people put in is also a, fu is also a function of risk. Uh, so again, additional data, at least on these two, on, on these two, uh, these two numbers. Uh, one other thing I'll, I'll come back to what uh, I think uh, George and Elizabeth commented on, you know, this, this role of timeliness, uh, uh, because I, I can appreciate that certain data are more sensitive or this concerns about disclosing certain data on, on a more timely basis. Uh, so clearly if, if information is provided on a timely basis, uh, it's more likely to be used by investors, exactly as Elizabeth said, right? If, if something is a year old, chances, chance that an investor today is, is analyzing that information to make decisions today is, is not going to be particularly high. Uh, but where I think timeliness is, like, you know, if, if you're going to compromise on one part, I would say timeliness is not as important to me as the availability of granular information relevant to assess audit quality. And, and the more granular of the data on audit inputs and audit work, work papers is very useful. Like to evaluate audit quality, if we move from data at the level of the individual audit firm to the level of audit offices or even data at the audit partner level can be very useful for to, to investors to assess audit quality. The, the reason why can timeliness with which such data is, is, this, is made publicly available uh, has, I'd say, a secondary role is because 
when audit firms know that certain data will become publicly available or the PCOB will inspect an audit engagement and publicly disclose a report card after that inspection, audit firms will respond to the prospect of these disclosures in order to look, avoid looking bad in the future. In other words, knowing that information about audit deficiencies would be disclosed to investors after the inspection will lead to changes in, in the behavior of audit firms before the inspection. And, and, and we clearly see evidence of such a response under the current system with respect to the quality control or part two findings. You know, so, so currently the PCOB is, is as you all probably know, uh, the PCOB does not publicly disclose an audit firm's quality control deficiencies following its inspection. Uh, the PCOB gives audit firms at least one year to address its concerns with respect to these quality control issues identified, uh, and the deficiencies are disclosed only if the PCOB is not satisfied with the steps firms took to address its concerns. Uh, so yeah, I looked at a sample of 276 inspection reports uh, that were made public by the PCOB from 2006 to, to, to 2014, and of these, 68%, so 189 of the inspection reports had a non-public quality control deficiency. So there was a deficiency identified, but only seven of these were eventually disclosed uh, for, for, for audit firms not satisfactorily addressing the concerns. So, so firms respond to incentives that are provided to them. And, and if, if later disclosure is gonna give them incentive to, to do a more thorough job before the fact, uh, I think that is something that, that, that can be useful, you know, in addition to just providing uh, 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 more timely information. So, so if I have to compromise on one thing, I would compromise on the timeliness uh, and ask for more information, even if it's even, even if it's just closed later. So if I think about what both you and Elizabeth have, have commented so far, clearly the nature of the data that's being shared is, is first and foremost, right? And then the granularity around that and that balance between getting the access to that information in a reasonable time frame to keep its value, to keep its usefulness intact, as well as the ease of accessing that information all, all, all comes into play. If is there would either of you before I move to George, would either of you kind of group these uh, suggestions, these intended um, uh, indicators that you've added on to or that you are, are requesting, would you group them in a different fashion that we would share with the PCAOB around what we're asking for or how we're, or why we're asking for it? Is there a way in which to, to present it in that manner? I, I, I don't know. I, as, I've been, as you've been speaking, I've been making notes, but I, I, I'm not sure I see a pattern that can be easily digestible. I mean, you're, I, like I said, uh, I, I totally echo Nemeth's comments um, on staffing. I sort of wrapped all that up in um, just emphasizing how great your letter was, where you, you went into detail on that. So I think those categories are great. Um, I think uh, the adding on was, um, you know, just specifying, for instance, the findings you know, of the inspections. I think that's part of what you have there for inspection results, but it wasn't totally clear. Um, but in terms of other, you know, categories, it's really going a little a little more into, under um, the fees, you know, the total fees and the city office and the partner, um, the partner and, and maybe you, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how you categorize it. Maybe it's independence, um, that kind of thing. So, and then restatements, and enforcement action history to be able to have that, to be able to pull that up when you're looking at um, a company in the database would be really helpful. And whether the engagement letter has an arbitration clause. So I, maybe it's just grouping it by companies and, and the different issues. Um, okay, thank yeah. you. Um, Nemit, anything to add before I move to George, please? And, and one additional way to, to group also is, is based on uh, information about audit inputs versus the outputs. You know, so uh, okay. so some of it uh, input is things like fees and hours and the names of the audit partners or other personnel, the office from where they're performing the audit from. Uh, 
uh, and then some of it is output, right? Like uh, the, the inspection findings, uh, uh, audit adjustment data. So, so there, I think differentiating between these two because they have different meaning, uh, I think is is another way. Uh, and again, I mean, making all of this machine readable is is, uh, uh, is something that would be very useful. So currently, you have some database providers that that do do this, but. Uh, uh, still, a lot of data remains in, on a, like a PDF form, which is hard to, which is then uh, difficult to extract from. And at least this duplicative effort, right? Several people do the same thing. Uh, so it's, if, if we can avoid that, I think it'll be good. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and, and in this day and age of technology, you always you always sort of wonder how can we harness technology uh, to 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 make this an easier, uh, uh, an easier, less friction. Full process for others. So, George, let me move over to you. Uh, a, a long list, perhaps, uh, but I just thinking through the kinds of things that I've seen on the PCAOB website, the kinds of things that the board has talked about, not just in their strategic plan, but also uh, in what this uh, PCAOB board aspires to uh, in, in reinvigorating uh, the PCAOB. Could you share your thoughts in terms of? Availability, not uh, potential hindrances versus not, or how you'd like to frame that, please. We're happy to, Alicia. Um, great, great discussion, and certainly appreciate the, the, the list. Where I'll call it the list, were helpful because it laid it out quite well from you know, maybe two different perspectives. So thank you both, um, Elizabeth and Emmett, for that. And one thing, Elizabeth, I'll pick up on. Um, you know, the form AP um, process or auditor search that's been in place now for you know a handful of years or so, um, I think is in, you know incredibly helpful where where it provides transparency by by partner name by um, the other participating firms if they're above I think a five percent threshold it gives visibility that heretofore was pretty much completely unless you were in the know maybe an audit committee or you would have no visibility so that certainly is a tool that. That is, you indicate, well, it doesn't answer all your questions. I don't want to suggest it does, but it does provide a lot of transparency that didn't exist before that's readily available to, to, to anyone on our website. Um, in terms more broadly, maybe, you know, from our, to bring it back to the inspection process for a second, I'll come back, maybe, Lisa, to your, to your question. Um, we have a risk based program. So, by risk, by definition, we're looking at a lot of the data points. Um, that, that were mentioned, uh, maybe not every single 1, but, but most of the data points that were mentioned. Uh, we're looking at to varying degrees. So we're getting information from pub publicly public sources, whether it's the SEC, whether it's other aggregators um, that provide information about, about companies, um, the media, short sellers, as has been mentioned in one of the earlier panels, we get information as we think about which files to select, um, particularly for the major firms, um, as well as industry data, we're looking for outliers of a given industry, whether it's oil and gas or banking. We 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 um pull all that together, uh, certainly with assistance from our colleagues in the Office of Economic and Risk Analysis help us pull that together, as well as firm data. Um, and you might say, what is the firm data? So, so things we get, this, this won't be a, a laundry list, but, but things are partner information, the, the engagement composition, the, the engagement partner, you know, IT partner, the EQR, the, the um, concurrent reviewer, if you will. Um, so we get information around that type of data. We get information on, you know, as Nem and I think both Elizabeth mentioned fees, we have that certainly publicly, but we also look at audit hours um, for a given engagement, internal risk ratings, things like that we, we, we look at, as well as the, the, the use of, of other auditors, um, either within a network or outside of a network. So we're looking and trying to pull together a number of data points as we think through from a risk perspective, what are the right issuers to, to inspect, select for inspection, as well as the, the focus areas within those files. Um, Another area where we, where we get information as we think through our processes around the firm's system of quality control. Um, so certainly policies, procedures, um, you know, independence, client acceptance, retention, um, areas such as that, partner compensation, and what the process is, where the controls through that. Um, you know, certainly looking forward to ultimately a new, new QC standard and QC 1000 that will hopefully provide more, more clarity around that. We get a lot of information to understand the firm's system of quality control. Um, you know, looking at the, the, um, the, the, the annual and special reporting through our website, you know, form two information, the form three, the form fours. Um, we use that information as well to pull, pull together in terms of understanding what's happening with what's a large firm or, or a smaller firm. And I would just say 20 years into our processes, um, we have a lot of cumulative knowledge 
about the firms um, and about certain offices, certain partners, possibly that helps us all make you know, make our broader selections. So that's that, that's our broader process, Alicia. If I may put put that way, um, again, coming back to the the list that were provided, again, I, I'll, certainly very very helpful. Um, it's hard, you know, on, on the spur of the moment to try to take the, the list as I was jotting notes down. Is is um, Elizabeth and them were talking to, to bucket them on the fly. What's possible? What's not possible? Certainly, it gives us a lot of, of food for thought um, as we can take back and think through what 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 is possible, what's easier, what's maybe not so easy. Whether there's well, there's other constraints that we need to think through, um, but it is a is a is a good starting point um, to to think through. So the list were were helpful. Thank you, George. And uh, you know, it, it's it's not intended to put you on the spot here, but but really to 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 kind of share a perspective uh, from two very well informed fellow panelists uh, from uh, in in terms of what else uh, can Absolutely. be done. Absolutely. Is there? Thank you. Thank you for your understanding. Is there a is there an additional component that we need to think about just a minute or two? Because uh, I, I'd like to leave the time for, for Q&A if there is around interoperability with other agencies. Do we does it make sense for the PCAOB to run this on their own or to perhaps build linkages with data that might be elsewhere. George has alluded to the risk process and how you're you're, you're building your list of, of, of issuers and firms that you're going to review on an annualized basis. Elizabeth Nemet, any thoughts on that, please? Or any perspective? Are there other are there other entities that you also find data from that informs your process and your analysis of this type? I mean, uh... From talking to my analysts, that I mean, a lot of regulators uh, provide them with much more detail on inspection findings. I, if that's what you mean, um, yeah. I mean, they when I talk to them and tell them we can't get that, we don't know what they're look what it, what the findings are um, for the company because they hear maybe they're they hear in conversation that there were some findings, but they can't they have no information. They they're kind of shocked that they can't see anything about the inspection. So. They're just used to getting it in a number of other industries. I mean, healthcare just being one of them. I mean, I'm sure Mary Berso here knows well. Um, so yeah, it just is. They're confused so about that. Why we don't get it? Understood. Emmett, last thoughts. Uh, no, exactly as Elizabeth said. I think uh, I mean it's relative to other countries. Uh, I think the the PCOB provides more data, but relative to other regulators. Uh, and industry specific uh, data availability, like for banks and insurance companies and, and others, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's less. So uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Saba, I see your hand up. Would you like to kick off the Q&A? Saba, you're on mute. Thank, thank you, thank you, Alicia. Elizabeth noted that um, data on a city office would be helpful, and I was my question is like, does it still is it still relevant in in remote working model? So, so Elizabeth, I the question is is city office data relevant in remote working model? So your perspective on that would be helpful. Uh, is, is it relevant in in sorry? And what was that in the in the remote working model, so you said data on city office would be helpful. And my question is, is it relevant in remote working model? Like a lot of companies is, you know, are now working remotely. Yeah. So does it matter? Um, yeah, I mean, it's very important because it can be, I mean, it, if you're aggregating up, it's not going to be as important as useful, but the more you, you can give us around, you know, they always say, follow the money, right? I mean, we, we would really like to know how, how important a certain audit is to a city office and to the partner. Because like I mentioned, I mean, this conversation we had with the board where um, they said they would love to just use a partner over here in a totally different part of the country. And they were read the riot act for even thinking of doing that, of changing offices. It, it just emphasized the point to us that, um, you know, that is a pretty important that, that the independence, we want to understand if there is a potential a metric or 
a other data point to give more context around the auditor independence, and this seems pretty important after our experience. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, Christina, thank you for, for your comment uh, pointing out that uh, linking form AP uh, to Edgar can uh, uh, get audit partner fees by city office uh, because that information is in Edgar and uh, the auditor search data set has the audit firm city partner and state information. So some low hanging fruit. Uh, thank you for, for, for making that information available. Well, I just want to give credit to Hal's idea. That was his idea. Like, in I think at our first IAG meeting, he asked if if those two data sets are linkable, and I said yes through the CIK ID, and 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 that's that would be you know what Elizabeth just said reminded me that that's a use case where you if you link those that you will get the information that. Um, already because they're already publicly available. Thank you, Christina and Hal. Uh, David, please, your question. Yeah, I, I just, it, it's quite a simple question really, which is that uh, I, I, I it, certainly in the UK, the audit contract between the issuer and the auditor is not made public. And it just seemed to me a lot of the data that um, a, we've been discussing would be in that audit contract, which, of course, is written for investors. That's why we do the audit. And I was just wondering whether that might be a way forward and how difficult it would be um, to persuade the industry that, um, that the, uh, the investors for whom the audit's done should have sight of the contract um, a according to which the audit is being done. Interesting. Uh, which of our panelists would like to approach the question? I mean, I, I can I can weigh in, and and this is I mean, but I like I can hear audit firms basically pushing back, saying that uh, the contract contains proprietary information about what they do, uh, and to the extent they're revealing some of this proprietary information to others. Uh, it can it can harm them. The, I mean, obviously, the flip side is, is yes, this information would be very valuable to investors. Uh, so, so the, there is an argument for why it should be disclosed. Uh, but I can I can see the I can appreciate I, I, the I can sure. see them doing that as well, Nemit. But but I mean, the reason that they're they're supposed to have all these clever ways of auditing is for the investor, and not to even to tell the investor that this is something that you're intending to do. I mean, I can I can see them pushing back, but I wonder whether that might be a way of getting a lot of the information that, that Elizabeth and you were talking about in terms of the input. I mean, one, one compromise, or at least one place where I think the board comes into place is, is uh, uh, this is certainly something that uh, the audit committee chair yeah. Uh, audit committee of the board can see, right? And to the extent they have expertise, uh, they should be able to understand some of the information to evaluate everything we're talking about before. And, 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 and you could have people like Elizabeth coming and saying, hang on a minute, in your audit contract, you didn't have that. How come that wasn't covered? Um, and, and it would get the investor involved and just, just a thought. Do I not recall that the fee information is disclosed in the financial statements? So we do have we do have components of what's in that in, engagement letter. So you're referring to additional details in that engagement letter, David? Yeah, essentially, what's the contract? What has the auditor said that it's going to do when it audits the issuer on behalf of the investors, that the investors should have access have access to that? And perhaps we want to comment on it. So you're, you're, you're and it would include lots of the data, for example, that Elizabeth was talking about, because it would name who the audit partner was, who it was that was working, presumably the amount of time where they were going to visit, who else they were going to hire. Is this all being done by Chinese companies? Da, da, da. That would all be likely to be in the contract, wouldn't it? And so it already exists. And I just wondered whether the publication of that might be something that would give you really quite a big leap forward in terms of the data available. Understood. Thank you for that detailed articulation. Mary. Thank you. Um, it's very informative. I want to go back to 
the the idea that investors are owners of the business and from that perspective i find it very difficult to know that all this information is available the auditors sharing it with the audit committee uh there's inspections and yet we're in the dark i mean i get proxy statements and i have to vote to re-engage the auditor and i have very little information so i for one think we're an investment advisory group i think we should be an invest investor advocacy group and start asking for timely information and if the information is being presented to the audit committee why can't we see it why can't we see what's being presented and to have to download pdfs and you know piece things together and go to a pcaob website to get information i mean that takes a tremendous amount of resource and time so why aren't we making it easy for the owners of the business to look at the business and make a, a conscious decision to stay with the business or or not um and i think the audit is a very very important piece of the quality of management evaluation that we all need to go through so i really support more transparency and elizabeth thanks for your questions they were they were excellent for your points um that's all Thank you, Mary. Um, Lynn. Yeah, <clears throat> a couple uh, points. One on uh, revenues by office. Uh, the office uh, managing partner and the partners in those offices are in part evaluated based upon how that office performs and uh so the magnitude of revenues from a particular audit in that office compared to the overall fees of the office do impact evaluations and uh, what the compensation and draws of the and shares of the partners will be so it is as elizabeth said very relevant and and um, important information as far as the audit engagement letters uh, having written and signed those and seen seen them even up to the current time period i think most of you would be somewhat sorely disappointed in what is actually in one of those letters uh, for the most part they're somewhat of a form uh, letter uh david they don't disclose the information that you're talking about you, you get the name of the partner probably out of there you get what they're uh charging but you don't redo the engagement letter every year either sometimes firms will only issue a new engagement letter say periodically every three years or whatever so uh uh, and that is a private contract between those two parties. And uh, I'd like to see them just to see if it was the audit committee chair or someone else that was signing them up. But I don't think you're gonna see all this information. I don't think there's as, as much mystique about those letters as you might uh, think there would be. Thank you for for elaborating, Lynn. Uh, perspective from any of the panelists on that? I would just say, yeah, I think a lot, some of it, uh, what we really need is what was actually done on the audit, so like how it was executed. It's great. I mean, I, I think, it, yeah, putting those uh, engagement letters as an exhibit or something attached to the 10K, I mean, we get lots of other contracts that way. That would be great. Um, but we really need certain pieces of data and in a database like like we were talking about. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, so to be able to pick that up and search by a company and um, the, the audit quality indicators and uh, and certain you know ways the audit actually worked out, like like we talked about in terms of staffing, those hours, uh, what where they were assigned, were they on those, those risk areas, how do they square with the critical audit matters, by the way, which we read all the ways. Uh, they're really important and we really appreciate the critical audit matter 
uh, disclosures. They're a little too boilerplate typically, um, but that's um, are incomplete, but to be continued there. So, but thank you for the disclosure. That underlying technology that makes access easier is such an important ingredient, right? As part of this, it really is part of the dialogue of not just the what you want and the timing around that, but access as well. Um, Dwayne, just checking whether you had your hand up. I, I did. I was going to clarify similar to Lynn's point that in my experience, the in the engagement letter is not where the auditor would cover the scope of the audit that's done with, you know, it's separate presentations. In fact, we require certain communications to under our standards and they that in my experience, it's usually done in certain communications to the audit committee, which could be memos or presentations or PowerPoints, things like that. And that's going to differ, you know, depending on the engagement and the client and whatnot, the form of those communications. That's the sort of thing you'd want to see, I think, Dwayne. Yeah. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Take it down. No, that was all. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Dwayne. Appreciate your pre appreciate your input. Uh, well, we are at five oh one. So on that note, thank you so much to Elizabeth. Uh, to Nemet and to George for taking the time and uh, sharing your perspective. We really, uh, on behalf of the subcommittee, we really appreciate it. Um, and let me hand over back to Saba, please. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you to the panelists, and thank you to everyone. Uh, this was tremendously helpful, it gave us many ideas to take into consideration. Uh, we will be in touch, Amy and I'll be in touch about next steps. Uh, from this meeting and uh, please mark your calendars for the June 7th meeting. It's in person, so we look forward to seeing you in DC. Uh, hope you all can make it. Uh, more information on that. With that, I will say I'll hand it over to Amy if she has anything to say. So thank Nothing you, everyone. To say. No. Thank you. I think the meeting is adjourned.